Welcome to Inside Admission, the podcast that gives you a behind the scenes look at the college admission process with the experts in and around college admission. Welcome to the Inside Admission podcast. I'm your host, Andy Palumbo, uh, and I'm really excited for today's guest. Uh, today we have with us on the podcast, Vern Granger uh, from the University of Connecticut. Uh, so welcome to the podcast, Vern. Thanks, Andy. Pleasure being here. So, uh, Vern, why don't we just kick off? Tell us a little bit about your background, uh, your path to UConn, and um, you know what's drawn you to work in college admissions. Yeah, so I'm one of those weird folks who you would consider an admissions lifer. Um, <laughs> you know, I got into the profession, you know, pretty much after undergrad. Um, you know, I started working at a small two-year private college outside of Raleigh, Lewisburg. Um, I did that for about a year or so and then moved over to North Carolina State. And that's where I did my grad work. Um, that's where I worked for 11 years. Um, you know, just very, very early on knew that this was my career pathway that that I wanted to go into. I mean, I know that there's no undergrad major in admission. I mean, we <laughs> all you know, end up in it one way or another, but I was fortunate to really get into it early. Um, and so being at North Carolina State, uh, that led to the opportunity at the University of Tennessee. Um, and then I went to Ohio State University. I was at Ohio State for um, about almost eight years. And then recently have been at the University of Tennessee, excuse me, University of Connecticut. I've been at UConn for about three and a half years now. So, you know, it's hard to believe that, you know, I've been here that long already, but it's been really, really, really great being in New England, being not far from where I grew up in New Jersey. Um, so, so just the best of, you know, not only from a professional standpoint, but from a personal standpoint. So living in New England's great and working for a place like UConn is fantastic. So Vern, I couldn't help but, but think as you're listing off the places you've worked at, a common question uh, friends and family alike must have had pretty frequently is, how can I get tickets? Uh, <laughs> some uh, some great, great tradition oh, of success goodness. at those places. Yeah, yeah. You can imagine, I mean, especially, you know, this, you know, this time of year with the you know, basketball and the tournament and, you know, our men's and women's teams historically do very, very well. And, you know, um, and then being at the Ohio State University, obviously football is pretty big. And, you know, oh, they have, they have football there? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah they, have <laughs> they play in a little rinky-dink stadium, you know, 100,000 plus, you know, folks um, there. So, yeah, Ohio State, Tennessee, and NC State. So, yeah, yeah, I've been – if you are a sports fan like I am, I mean, the places that I've been at have obviously been, you know, ones that have that – experience for for the students and so it makes it not only attractive and fun for students um but also for staff as well being able to go to the games and getting to know folks in the coaches and and folks in athletics and um you know realizing that they're in a lot of ways um you know very similar to what you see in person but on tv but you know when you get to know them and them as an individual you realize that a lot of ways they're not much that much different than what we're doing and you know it's just what we're doing in you know in our work i remember a conversation when i was at ohio state and i remember um it was one of my first onboarding meetings it was the coaches meeting and you know i saw urban meyer there. and so <laughs> i had a mutual friend who you know went up and introduced me to him and you know he's like Byron granger yeah yes sir and <laughs> you worked at University of Tennessee, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, since I worked at Florida, you know, we don't like each other. So, um, <laughs> you know, start that relationship off to a great, great start. And yeah, I remember having another conversation with him about, um, you know, he brought up on his own how our jobs are very similar in the sense that we have, you know, folks who, who really don't have the familiarity with our jobs who will comment about things that we should be doing and so you know he talked about how you know he'll have fans who will you know come into him regularly well you should have ran the ball on this down or you should have threw on this down just like you know 
we have people say to us, you know, have you ever thought about doing college fairs? For instance? Ooh, that's a good idea. Yeah, great idea. You know, <laughs> I, I, every time they tell me that, I, I just have to write it down because it's so profound. But, but you know, yeah. So, you know, that was that's one of the the things I've really appreciated. It's just getting to know not only the coaches but just you know the faculty and staff, and and that's one of the great things about working at a university. Thanks for sharing that, Vern. <clears throat> and uh, I was telling Vern before we started recording, you'll probably hear the pitter patter of. Uh, uh, my almost two-year-old running around the house. We like to keep it authentic here on the uh, the Inside Admission podcast. So, to our listeners, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's that's what you're hearing. So, uh, um, so anyway, um, so I, I'm super excited to have you here because because of that background, I, I think you bring a really distinctive uh, experience that uh, to date on the podcast. I don't think we've really had someone who's worked at institutions uh, with the same type of scale. Uh, that you've worked at. So I'm really excited to get into your perspective um, and to hear how some of these processes work at, at uh, you know, large schools, uh, large public institutions with large application pools. So, uh, but before we get yeah. to that, uh, it's really a, a, a tradition. Oh, and here's my great Dane Moose. Everyone's joining the podcast today. So we've got a, uh, we've got a full house here. I've got tigers in here with me and he, <laughs> yeah, he's not as interested in it as, as your Moose. So he's just, <laughs> He's sitting by me right now, laying down and, you know, has no interest in what we're talking about. Right now, so. <laughs> so, uh, so Vern, uh, it's a tradition on the podcast to, uh, to have you as the guest talk about your own college admissions process. So walk us through what that was like, what was important to you as you were navigating that process and, um, you know, how did you ultimately, uh, make your final decision? Yeah, so I'm going to sound like an old man right now when I say, you know, back in my day when we looked at it and, you know, the kids of the day, they don't realize how easy they have it. And, you know, I remember, you know, you go into the guidance office with the school counselor and, you know, there's the big binder and it has, you know, all the Peterson's Guide or whatever it may be. And it has all the colleges listed in there. And, you know, you're going to talk to your school counselor to get that information. I still remember, you know, going through the process. I still remember the first admission letter that I received, a, a yes answer. It was from a um, school in New Jersey. Um, at that time, it was called Trenton State um, College. Um, now it's called the College of New Jersey. And I just remember the excitement that I got when I got that first admissions letter. I mean, I, you know, I think back to it now. And, and you know, when when we send out our admission decisions, you know, I think, I think back to that and just think how just amazingly exciting it's got to be for, for the students knowing that, you know, for many of them, you know, this is their dream and, and to get that actually fulfilled. I mean, it just ends up making everything great. Um, now that school that I got that first letter from wasn't the one that I ended up going to. I ended up going to school down in North Carolina, but, you know, I still remember that whole process. I still remember the conversations with um, a whole bunch of folks as far as ultimately deciding on, you know, where I'm ultimately going to be going to school. That's great. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing that Vern. And um, I'm curious and I'm, I'm hoping you'll, you'll be there with me because I've asked the last two guests where we've talked about this process and they're like, no, no, you, you were kind of alone. Um, but you know, like it, we're we're old school, right? Like we were going out to the mailbox right. every day, right? There wasn't a portal. We were going checking the mailbox, you know, looking for the big envelope, and uh, <laughs> not the small, not the one. small the one, not the small one. No, the small one just sat on the kitchen <laughs> table for a couple of days, no one opening exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so can you remember what it was like after you hit submit and you were you were waiting and and you know like waiting for if it was like me, you were waiting for like. Seemed like 10 years, but I guess it was probably three, four months. What was that like? Oh, oh, Andy, 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 you were such a kid because <laughs> there was no submit when I was doing applications. It was actually a paper and 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 pen. Well, mine was mine was paper too. I'm 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 slipping up yeah. here. It's it's my 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 yeah, old man brain. So when I put it in the envelope <laughs> and mail it. Yeah, you know, that's what I had to do. So again, that's what I mean. These kids have it easy. They, <laughs> They can do it online. They can do a common application or a coalition app um, and have it sent to multiple schools. 
they can pay for it online. They don't have to get mom or dad to write a check <laughs> or, you know, go to the school counselor, get a, a paper fee waiver or, you know, the, the school counselor can send the transcripts in most cases electronically. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I remember, you know, going through the process of having to write down, you know, answers to all of those questions by hand and the whole application. Um, and, and so, you know, so, but, but I will say it ends up making it that much more memorable because you remember actually sitting down and writing your name and address for every single one of the applications that you, you were submitting an application for. So, yeah, I still remember I used, I used the paper common app, Mm -hmm. but I, like some people would photocopy it, right? I used the blue pen yeah. uh, every time, just yeah. copying the information. So each school would think they were number one. So th- there've always been the, the <laughs> tricks or like you, you get the advice from the person who graduated the year before. I'm sure I got that from someone. Yeah. I'm not clever enough to, to think that one up myself, but. Uh... Yeah, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. Um, so uh, that's, that's really what I want to talk about today is, is sort of that period. Like once these students hit submit, don't typically don't send it in the mail now. Um, you know, they're waiting. There's a lot of questions for students and parents alike. Like, what is happening at UConn? What are they doing in stores with my application? And so that's yeah. really what I want to what I want to talk about today. Um, you know, is just this idea of like, okay, give it to me straight. How does it all work? So first off, I think it's really important for people to understand that uh, you know, UConn, you get far more applications than you could possibly say yes to. Right. Right. And so there's gotta be something that you and your team are are considering as you're making decisions. So, so what is it that UConn is looking for uh, when you're reviewing applications? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, UConn, like a lot of schools, you know, we're going to get more applications than we actually would have space for. Um, And when we say have space for, you know, the number of students that we want to have in our first year class that the university has determined is optimal for the learning experience, whether it be residence halls, classrooms, um, auxiliary services, you know, all of those things. So we're thinking about those things when we're talking about the numbers that we're looking at. Um, but, you know, we, like a lot of other universities, you know, we are, our, our admissions process is based on the mission, the priorities of our institution. So, you know, the university, we are prioritizing certain things. Like we want to see diversity, capital letter D, you know, whether it be backgrounds, interest, programs, all, all of those things. So, you know, we're taking those things um, in, in consideration. The residency, you know, we, you know, we are the flagship of yeah. Connecticut. So obviously, you know, Connecticut students are our top priority, but we are also a national and international university. And so we, we believe in attracting students from outside of Connecticut as well, because we know that that adds to the whole university experience. And so, you know, we, we are building our admissions process based on the priorities that the university ultimately sets forth. And then it involves, you know, the training of our readers, both our full-time staff on our seasonal readers, you know, that we will, we will bring in and training them about those priorities, training them about how we want them to be looking at transcripts, uh, training them on how we consider those non-cognitive variables, you know, train them in that we, we're, we're not, we don't have established minimums in our process because we want them to use their professional judgment, understanding the priorities in how we are trying to build a class. And that's probably the final piece that I want to emphasize is that, you know, we're not admitting classes, you know, at, you know, whether it be UConn or, you know, WPI or wherever it may be, you know, that has selective admissions. We're building a class and because admissions means that, you know, you put all the GPAs on a spreadsheet and you put a line below some number and then everybody above that is above is admitted and everybody below is not. And that's simply not our power process works because we know that there's an important um, thing that has to be considered and that's context and the context of where that student is coming from, the curriculum that they are offered, 
um, the, your, your curriculum that they're taking, uh, the things they're involved in, their life experiences, all of those things in consider along with the priorities of the university. And, and, and that's the, that's, that's the, the big thing about our process. And I know sometimes it's frustrating for, for folks on the outside simply because, you know, we like things easy. You know, we want to know, hey, I get this. It's a yes, no binary decision. And, and, and you know, it, it doesn't work that way. And, and the reason is, is that we are, we have that goal, you know, trying to support the educational mission of our institution, which requires us to go into that level of detail, you know, when we're evaluating an application for admissions. Uh, it's just such an excellent uh, and, and thoughtful answer, Vern. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, just taking a step back, that's, that's exactly why I started this podcast was, was answers like that from people in seats like yours, you know, a, a name brand university people know of tens of thousands of people apply to your school, but to be able to hear an honest answer about the fact that, you know, it's, it's certainly based in academics, but then it's much more. It's about the, the things that drive a university forward, its mission, its purpose, um, and, and I think that, you know, one of the questions we get a lot this time of year, you know, it's, it's as of this recording, it's April one. So most traditional admissions decisions are out. Some institutions are still rolling and still accepting applications, uh, certainly, but a big question we've heard throughout the past month and, and several months for those of us with early admissions options, why? And, and I think right there, you've, you've heard an honest answer and, I think it's difficult for individual students and parents that don't get the personalized why. Um, but yeah. I, I think having an honest understanding of what's going on in the background is, is really important. And actually, uh, Vern, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It, yeah, if I would add to that, I think something else that I think parents and students, you know, I try to talk to them a lot about, but I don't think that they fully appreciate is that the decision, if by chance the decision is not to receive admission, it is not a negative reflection on right. that student. It's not a negative reflection on what they've done. Um, it, and I think, that's, I think that's probably what causes a lot of the frustration and the, you know, the hurt and all of that because they're internalizing it as, well, this university says that I'm not good enough. And that is as far from the case as possible and, and try to get folks to, to understand that, you know, your, your ability to be successful should not be, you should not associate it with an admission decision because that is not the purpose of an application review that a university does and ultimately that admission decision. So true. I, I mean, I, I still remember going through the process and, and thinking, and someone told me along the way that a school was a school was a lock for me, and that school was was really my number one, and and I didn't get in, right. and and you know personally it stung, and and there was that sense of judgment, right. and you know I would I would never name uh, Middlebury as that school, uh, no I'm kidding it wasn't Middlebury, uh, but uh, it, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll allow the school to remain nameless, um, but uh, it was Wesleyan. Um, but anyway, uh, so I, I think that it took me probably a year before realizing, wow, like I probably wasn't what they were looking for. And the school that I ended up at was perfect for me. It challenged me. It opened my eyes. And, and that's what I think is that it's, it's really difficult to see beyond that admission decision for those schools and however you yeah. may rank them. But really that one spot opens up to so many different pathways and opportunities after that point that it's the possibilities are endless. And, and most of them are positive. If students have done uh, their research ahead of time, if, if they uh, keep a positive mindset. So, um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. So I'm, I'm actually going to yeah. share a, uh, a little insider information here that uh, our audience doesn't know. And, and Vern, you don't know, but, but you're actually a key player in this story. So um, Vern's like, Oh no. Um, so, uh, uh -oh. past, uh -oh. this past October, uh, it was a, a rainy, uh, late October day in Connecticut and I was driving down to, uh, Pomfret 
and Vern and I had a program there. Oh yeah, and uh, it was it was a great little program Saturday morning. Uh, I, it was my first indoor program uh, since COVID hit. And, um, you know, we had a, a, a great conversation. Yeah. And one of the things, you know, when I get the opportunity to, to, to share the stage with, with a pro like uh, Vern, I, I learned something every single time. Like, and that's, that's not a joke. Like, I, I learned something. And that was really in my head as I left there. I, like, I had a blast. It was a lot of fun. But I, I learned some stuff. Um, so shout out to Bruce uh, at Pomfret for putting together a great program. But I was driving home. I was listening to a podcast. There was like a comedy podcast. I was a fan of then. And it just sort of like hit me. I was like, I wish we could have scaled that. Like, you know, Vern and I, I, I feel like we, I feel like we had a good presentation that day, right? We were funny. We were, you know, like people were laughing at our, at our canned jokes. And I just thought, man, if we could bottle this and just like broaden the access to it. Um, and, and so I noodled with that for a couple months and it ended up being this, like this crazy idea to just say, I'm just going to hit Vern up out of the blue and say, Hey Vern, I want to, I want to record a conversation with us talking admissions. And, and uh, so, so that's the origin story. I mean, like that was the the first time I had the the thought. And then I, you know, listening to folks like uh, Ken Anselman, who was my guest last week, uh, who's a uh -huh. huge motivation. And I just thought, let's do this, you know, like, let's try to get some more information out there for families that, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think doesn't get out there uh, as broadly. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, we can continue to, uh, to get that out there. So, yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, it was a fun, it was a fun panel. And, and I agree. I mean, it was, it's always nice to, you know, be able to present with, with, with folks who number one, know their stuff like you um, and, and have that passion. And, you know, I think we, I think it causes each other to feed off of one another. When you see somebody has that energy, when you see that someone, knows the knows the ins and outs and and has that energy um you know it's always a good thing so so i appreciate you saying that but but i felt the same way i mean it was definitely a great it was a great setting and made more so that it was the first time for a lot of us you know that we were do, we were able to do those these type programs since the pandemic and so. and i'm not blowing smoke Vern Vern won't toot his own horn but Vern, why don't you tell the audience what's your what's your role with NACAC right now <laughs> yeah so my you know my day job is that i don't know if that's a night <laughs> job whatever because my day job the one that pays the bills is the university of connecticut but but yeah i was elected recently as um chair elect the, the national association for college admissions counseling so professional organization prominent professional organization in the college admissions counseling profession so for individuals like us in the enrollment side, our, our school counseling colleagues, community-based organizations, those those individuals, those professionals in our field, you know, about 26,000 members all told, United States and worldwide. So yeah, it's a it, it's it, it's an it is an ultimate honor to be you know be elected. This was the first election um, of the, the the board that that was done by the entire membership. So it's obviously probably the most flattering thing to be, you know, recognized by your peers and, and the members are, are my peers. So, yeah, so it, it's really exciting to be, you know, be able to serve the profession, to pay it forward. You know, a lot of folks, you know, paid it forward to me to get me um, to this, this point in my professional career. So, so I see this service as my opportunity to be able to pay it forward and you know, really contribute um, to the profession and, and the members who, you know, I just think the world. So in case you had any question, all of us, college admissions professionals, school counselors, independent counselors, we all went to the polls. And we said, this is the guy. This is the guy. So that's who you're listening to right now. I just want to make sure people know because Vern's not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Or it could be the same. <laughs> Listen, they could be seeing me now and just be like, I voted for that guy. I voted for that clown. Can I get a no recount? No recount. No. You know? Yeah. So, um, so we'll, we'll jump back to this, but I, I just, I thought it was a fun aside. I mean, like I was thinking about it today. I was like, that was really when it all started for me, when it all clicked. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to have you on here today. Um, so, you know, we talked about the size and the scale of UConn, right? You know, 
you guys broke a record this year, over 40,000 applications for a first year class of about 3,900. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's a lot of reading. And to do so considering Mm -hmm. students context, that's really tough. And so like, I I think our listeners out there who haven't worked in the admissions office, uh, you know, they're, they're probably wondering about, you know, like, how much staff do you have reading? How much time are they spending on applications? Uh, Walk us through a little bit of that, like how it breaks down. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that is that is one of the first things that I hear from, you know, families or students is that truly you could not be looking at my essay or the contents of my my application. And the answer is yes, we absolutely do. And, you know, we we will invest a lot of financial resources to the application reading process because it is truly fund- fundamental to the work that we do that any admissions office does. The, the process that they undertake in building their class of students who are going to be enrolling, who are going to be adding to the, the experience, um, the educational mission of that institution. So that's why it's something serious that we really spend a lot of time on. And so it involves, again, the training of the readers. It involves, you know, that training of our full-time staff, as well as we will hire seasonal application readers. We'll bring them on in around September, and we will be training them about all of those things I talked about. We even train them on certain things. Um, We do a couple sessions on on implicit bias. You know, it's important for our readers to understand the biases, and let's just be real. We all have some bias that we bring to everything. And so it's important to understand that and how to separate it from the, the evaluation that you're doing. So, you know, it involves you know, spending a lot of time doing that in, in employing, you know, a large number of, of readers. In our case, we have about 60 total readers between the part-time and the full-time staff. And, and we're reading straight through um, from October all the way 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. <laughs> straight through, straight through. And, and, you know, but it also helped. I mean, we have a, I have a phenomenal leadership team and, you know, just um, folks who are keeping everything organized, who are just pros, um, stars in, in, at the university, who, who without them, and their managing of the whole process, there's no way it could, it could work. And so it, it involves all of those things that are taking place. And, and we are able to get all of those applications read by February. We're able to then, as a committee, take a look at all of those in the aggregate and look at them individually and make those decisions on you know those students that we're ultimately building our class so that in you know, late February, early March, when we release all the decisions for on-time applications, um, we, we, we were able to meet that and we've been able to meet it every year, but it's not without um, a ton of work by a lot of hardworking, committed folks in, in our office. And I, I think that's something that's, it's tough to really imagine just the complexity of it and I think one thing that gets lost very often in, in conversations is is the professionalism and the the sort of social science behind uh, some of the work that's being done. So I appreciate you bringing up things like the cognitive bias training, which I think is is not just becoming a norm, but is almost becoming uh, a necessary part of teams as they prepare to read and making sure that people are are aware of what their own biases are, so that they can uh, you know stop those sort of heuristics that get your, your, your quick brain thinking and do some more thoughtful, yeah. slower thinking as they're diving into the reviewing the students. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I guess, um, you know, I'm curious, is there a particular, is there a particular order that you read the get application in? And then, uh, you know, as, as you think about an application moving through the process, how many people are reading each application and, and, and yeah. ultimately what is the admissions committee? What does that look like? Does does every application go through that? Does a certain percentage of applications go through that? Just paint a picture for us. 
Yeah, yeah. So the first part is the reading of the applications. And so having the readers do their assessment evaluation of the application and, you know, call out those things that stand out in the application. So there's a there's the quantitative analysis that they're doing where they're rating the, the application, but there's also the qualitative assessment, those things that stand out about about an applicant that they're all they're doing in that read. And each application will have at least two folks reading it. In some cases, there could be three folks who are reading it. And that's, you know, that's the exercise that's taking place from that, um, you know, that October to February timeframe um, that, that, that I mentioned. And, you know, they're looking at all those components in the application. You know, typically a first read would be about, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then the second read, probably a little less than that, because the first read has really done a good job of, you know, really calling out and making a lot of those evaluations. But we do have a second reader who will, in essence, be a check and point out anything that may be that that may have been missed. And, and, and so October, February, that's what's taking place. That February time frame is when we go through committee and committee for us is is made up of our senior admissions team and 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 for that matter, um, senior enrollment team as well and 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 so we will all come together and all of those forty thousand applications will go through committee and and but we are breaking out those applications in certain groups. And so, you know, we'll be looking at residency. We'll be looking at academic program distribution. Um, we'll be looking at, you know, diverse, the other types of, of, of diversity. Um, and all of those things in, in, in totality um, will ultimately allow us to then get to that magic number. And that magic number is going to vary depending on the distribution. So, you know, for a for for the folks who are viewing this who may not be familiar, you know, for a school like like UConn or many you know other public universities for that 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 in, that reason, um, you know, we know that in-state students are going to yield a lot higher than an out-of-state student or an international student. So we know that you know we can admit. Uh, we need to admit more out-of-state students or international students in order to be able to bring one that's going to yield to the university. So all, what, the, what, what that ultimately goes to is that the total number of admits for us will vary depending on what that mix looks like. And then in the other populations, again, that we're looking at the analysis and the data and looking at our yield models historic yield models. So, you know, it could be, depending on the mix, it could be anywhere from, you know, 19,000, you know, folks that we would be admitting to, you know, sometimes 20, 21,000. So it just varies depending on those different factors um, that we are ultimately deciding on in, in the committee. And along with that, we are deciding on things such as um, wait list because, you kind of like a lot, a lot of other universities were planning for contingencies. You know, it's our hope that we were spot on and that number was exactly what we need to bring into class. But, you know, we're talking about 17, 18 year olds. And, 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 you know, I don't think anybody has that crystal ball that they can tell you exactly what they're thinking. And so, you know, we plan for things like if our yields are lower than what we had anticipated and, and so having that weight, that, that population of weightless students who we can go to if we need to. But, but I think something else that folks need to be aware of is that, you know, we as universities, um, we, we also understand the angst that students are going through when they get a decision. And we're not putting somebody on the wait list for the purpose of just stringing them along. So, so we don't put a hundred, two times more the number of students on a wait list um, simply because we can, we, we, we choose not to because we want to we want to make sure that we are putting just the right amount on there, but not too many that it is really causing 
undue anxiety for, for students who truly don't need to be on the wait list. We can let them know of the decision and let them go ahead and think about their sec second choice, third choice in institution. So, so those are all the things that we're thinking about during that February timeframe when we're in committee. And then, then, you know, we will put the packages together. We will mail them out. We have a, you know, a, a assembly line of, of students and staff who will be stuffing and we will be sending those decisions out. And, you know, at some point um, on that weekend, we will turn the switch on and all of those decisions will go out <laughs> and knock on wood. You know, since I've been at UConn or the other universities, we have not sent the incorrect decisions. Um, so, so it's all worked that is, out well. That is the so. scariest moment in an admissions director's year is when you're about to flip that switch. Yeah. <laughs> we actually, at, so at, at WPI, uh, we have uh, reviews, you know, like we, we're, we're lucky enough to have a, to have had a president uh, who cares deeply about uh, our admissions decisions, who we're admitting, how that's aligning with our, our mission and our plan. Um, she also was a NASA scientist. So our pre-release oh. meetings are called launch readiness reviews. So you can imagine the level of, <laughs> of rigor and intensity that goes into going around the table. Are we ready for launch? You know, it's uh, it, it, it gives you that true NASA feeling. And actually, uh, she's she's leaving WPI um, after commencement to go head up uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So, uh, yeah, so it, oh, wow. it, it, it is wow. very much well, while some might think of admissions as an art. There are some science aspects, too, and, and you definitely don't want to get wrong that uh, that final release. So. <laughs> So you can't, you know, we like to say a lot that, you know, sometimes we complicate our world and it's not rocket science. You actually say that, yes, it is rocket I science. I actually have to remind her sometimes that it's not rocket science. It's, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, but when we make a mistake, people aren't stranded in space. So um, that's, that's the plus side of admissions work, I think. Um, and, and we're blessed enough, uh, you know, as, as you know, in a selective admissions process, um, and to, to get serious here for a minute, um, you know, we make a lot of decisions uh, where we are turning away incredible young people, and they are going to go off, mm -hmm. and they are going to prove us we made the wrong decision, and maybe we made the right decision at the time. But you know, like I think that that's something just to to yeah. circle back to the point that that Vern made is that like, you, you know. It, in selective admissions, we make the wrong decision all the time because there's so many qualified students that are going to wind up at another institution <laughs> doing yeah. incredible things, incredibly yeah. happy about how that turn of events happened. And, and there's always that moment of disappointment. But if you're a student or a parent listening, um, you know, those are uh, uh, those are yeah. some of the things you should remind yourself as you go through that that difficult process. Enjoying the podcast? Like and subscribe to this YouTube video. You can also find us on the web at insideadmissionpodcast.com, and you can find and engage with us on social media, where our handle is Inside Admission, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Now, back to the pod. Yeah, I have to share a funny story. So when I was at the Ohio State University, there was a student who, and, and we had not admitted her to the university, um, but fast forward a couple years ago, and it was when um, the college football playoff was selecting and it was the year that it was between Ohio State and University of Alabama for that fourth spot and Alabama ended up getting the spot and Ohio State didn't make the playoff. So this student who ended up going to the University of Alabama and all indications she ended up, she, she did very, very well there, she actually posted on some, some bulletin board that got picked up about how the fact that, you know, how's it feel Ohio State to not be selected? Burn Granger. Um, <laughs> you know, after I was not admitted to my, uh, after I was not admitted to Ohio State. So, I mean, I, I, it, it was, I got to admit, it was hilarious. And I actually replied back to her saying, you know, you know, how that was, I'd love, I'd laugh when I read that. And I hope she's doing phenomenal work at, at her, at, at her institution. But, but yeah, you're, you're I think it's that, it's that type of resiliency that, that, um, 
I, I think we've seen even more uh, with this generation, you know, na navigating the challenges of COVID, of all the different ways the college admissions process have been impacted. I, I feel like I have a lot of hope for the future. Uh, we've got a lot of incredibly bright students who uh, can take the hits and 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 keep on um, keep on going. So, um, so I, I want to ask one really specific question because in, in a past life I was uh, I'm actually wearing a hat, Plymouth State University, um, go Panthers. Uh, so I, I remember a question that always happened around this time of year: admission decisions go out. You get the uh, the the tuition rate. You get the financial aid. Well, Fern, we have a we have a summer home in Connecticut. Um, do, are we Connecticut residents? Um, now, once my daughter steps foot on campus, she's a Connecticut resident, right? Residency, residency <laughs> is is one of uh, sort of the most challenging aspects of of the public uh, admissions world for those students who. Maybe aren't residents, but really wish they were. Um, when it comes time to consider the the cost of college at at a, a top tier public institution, so tell us a little bit about residency and and uh, in general, and then if there are any particulars that you think are important about about UConn. Yeah, I mean, you know, so first of all, every state is different as far as their residency rules, but the basic. You know, general rule of thumb is that the university is looking that this student um, has residency in the state for reasons other than, than educational ones. So and, 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 and there's another reason why we're very serious about, you know, our evaluation for residency is that, you know, for our in-state residents, the, the, the state, you know, in our case, the state of Connecticut is supplementing a certain dollar amount for each Connecticut resident um, to attend the University of Connecticut or any of the other Connecticut public universities. So, so there's a really serious reason why we do that and why we're not just trying to be difficult and stickler. So it truly is for the purpose of identifying those students who are residents of the, of, of, of the state um, in order to be able to um, give them that educational benefit, being a resident of the state, to be able to attend one of the public universities in, in, in the state. So it's something that's really serious that we do. And, and again, it's, you know, how they define that in, in you know, at the micro level is going to vary depending on the state. But generally, you know, we're looking that the student is there um, for reasons other than to go to the university. So, so you know, that's, that's a little bit about it, but I would encourage your, your, your folks out there to, you know, speak directly to the admissions office or the registrar or whatever office at that university that makes those decisions and, and get the specifics to how they're actually doing that evaluation. I'm not going to lie. I don't miss that. Um, so <laughs> I, I want to, uh, sort of, you know, you, you've given us so many insights and I really appreciate it, Vern. I mean, I, this is, exactly the type of conversation I envision when starting the podcast was just, you know, cutting behind all the stuff. There's everything we put on the website, but then really just getting the inside scoop from someone who, who leads a team that does this work. Um, so I really appreciate it. One of the ideas that's out there uh, in the public is this idea of college admissions as a meritocracy. You know, the, the best student should be admitted. Can you talk a little bit about this? Is this is is this real? Is this a thing? And and you know, if 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 you see it as it is, how would you define best, or can you define best? Yeah, and and I mean that is such a you know we could spend <laughs> five podcasts talking talking about this exactly, but you know, it all goes back to you know something I said at the beginning that you know as university admissions offices, you know, our number one goal is to build a class of students that are going to support the educational mission of the institution. Um, and so that's why, number one, you a student should not associate an admission decision with their ability to be successful because it is not, they are not um, one and the same. So, so that's the first thing, you know, that, that, that I would say about, you know, that piece of 
of, of the admission decision. And I think there's a confusion about what is defined as the best, how someone defines the best or, or how someone defines, you know, what is merit? Because for many folks, they, they define merit as the person with the highest SAT or ACT or the person with the highest GPA. When we know, and the data is, is you know, out there um, that, that there are contextual pieces of information that need to be considered when you're looking at any of those numbers. Not saying that there is zero value in the test scores or just looking at a number because again, there, there, you can get some information from it, but there's no way that you can make a direct, a, have a straight line of this person with the SAT is better than this person because their test score is better or your GPA is higher. There's no way to do that. And our evidence at our universities for the student success, how students perform backs that up hundred percent. So, so I think that's, that's another confusion that students have or families have about admissions being a meritocracy, you know, a lot of that is, is under the, you know, viewed in the lens that, you know, that meritocracy means that because I have the highest SAT, I deserve admission to that university over someone else. And that, that just simply is, is not the case because again, you're going back to all the stuff that I talked about. What are the priorities? What are we looking to build at our university? And that ultimately is what drives any admissions office. And, and by the way, that is something that, that is a view that has been affirmed court after court after court after court. The, the educational mission of an institution and the university you know, building that process and, and, and how that ties to the student entering the university and when they graduate and even, even after the university. So that's something that's not just a Vern Granger opinion. You know, there's some um, data that backs that, backs that up. There's legal precedent that backs that up. Um, and, it, and it, again, it just goes back to what, as an institution, we value and what we prioritize. And so... You know, what we prioritize at UConn is going to be totally different than what you all prioritize at WPI, what is prioritized at MIT, and, and on and on and on. And, 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 and that's, that's something that students sometimes have a hard time understanding. I mean, it's kind of like the whole scholarship conversation. You know, we, we, right now it's our admitted with student reception and, and, you know, I'm getting a number of, I got a number of families that come up to me. Well, you know, we did, we got this scholarship at UConn, but, you know, this school gave us this amount of money and this school gave us this amount of money. And, and again, it just all goes back to each individual institution has their own priorities and, and the reasons for the decisions that they are doing to support ultimately those priorities. Absolutely. I education. second that completely. And for those parents who are listening, those students, that's really hard to hear. Like, you know, like there's no way to understand. Mm -hmm. And so you combine the waiting with the ambiguity with the, I know this person that got X or I got Y at the other school. And it, it just builds into this process being such a, a black box at times for folks. And so, um, you know, it's, it's interesting as you brought up yeah. the fact that there's no line. I, I, I completely agree to that. I think it's a great visual for people to, to think about. I was having a lively discussion with someone who who was a firm believer in in the fact that we should uh, you know rank and stack people by standardized test scores you know feeling that this correlates to to intelligence and I talked about you know the importance of of really understanding students' contacts and understanding you know the distinct qualities and, and lived experiences that they bring to a university and and the fact that you know there are really important parts for certain universities, including mine, where, you know, things like empathy and cultural competencies are, are critical. And, and the response I heard back, which I, I think is understandable from somebody who doesn't do this work, but said, I'd rather my engineers have a perfect score on the SAT than have empathy or cultural competence. And, and I don't think we would, because I think we want our engineers to understand exactly who they're building for, what societal challenges they're trying to address with their Absolutely. skill set. And so I think that 
uh, you know, this, this, well, it can make the admissions process murky. Each school really understanding what it sees its place as in the world of, of uh, higher education and fulfilling that, I, I think, does serve our society uh, in really positive ways. So I, I appreciate you really underscoring that a couple times in, in this episode, Vern. It's, it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will say, you know, having said all that, all of that, um, I, to, there, there's a side of me that understands how families, students can be, you know, frustrated because again, it, it is not something that is, you can point to, you know, it's not right. a one plus two equals three type of thing. I mean, and, 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 you know, we, as, we as humans, we, we, uh, that's how we want to comprehend those, those types of things. So, yeah, I, I, I totally get it. And also, I will say, as institutions, you know, I don't think we do as good a job of talking about why our, our admissions process, why that, 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 that process that I talked about is so key to the educational mission. So, you know, I think a lot of times we talk about it in mm -hmm. the, the input stage, you know, students are coming into our university and we're looking at that. But I think that what we as, as universities and particularly enrollment, the enrollment side should be doing a better job of connecting that input with the output. So, so these students that we're bringing into the university, this is why it is so important because this is the experience that they are having as an individual, this is the experience that they are bringing to the university. This is what they are adding to the whole community. And so, so I think that, you know, you know, as somebody who's in the enrollment side, you know, we have to take some responsibility. And that's something that, you know, in my job, you know, I'm consciously thinking about how can we do a better job of telling that story and connecting the dots better that lets folks understand that this is why we well, this is why our process works the way it does. And, and, and these are the results. And this is, this is that, this is how we should, it, it shows that horizontal experience. So it's not just input. That's it. You know, it's all along that horizontal, that horizontal scale to the point when the student actually leaves and, and is an alum and they're alum. And they're so folks, this is Vern track. Granger and this has been his Ted talk. Um, uh, seriously, you you remind me of a, of a TED talk, and you got us right to where I wanted to sort of bring this full circle. Is we get asked a lot about the what and the how, and we're trained in answering those questions, and that's what we spend a lot of time talking about. But that why I think is is missing so often, and and I think you've just uh, described that so eloquently, um, and it, it makes me think about uh, you know as an example. At WPI, you know, we made the decision uh, a year ago to um, to eliminate the use of, of standardized testing. Um, we won't consider it even optionally. And and I had a faculty member who's a longtime faculty member and alum um, stand up and say, you know, like every school's got to make the decision that's right for them. But we're a school that is focused on high quality STEM education teaching in a collaborative way through group projects in, uh, you know, uh, uh, globally in, in, in sort of uh, uh, the context of, of the humanities, social science, uh, cultural competencies. He's like, we, we don't give tests like this. So why would that be a requirement for us? And he's like, you know, I, I, can, I can very often see the students who have understood you know, the test and, and, and what needs to, to happen and, and they get the score. And he said, you know, like, and, and at the end of the day, when I, I, I release groups to their sort of somewhat murky assignment with like a hard question that doesn't have clear answers, they're sometimes looking at me like, well, I need, I need more to go on. Like I need to understand what the steps are. And so there's so many different ways to learn and, and so many different things that, that students and schools can value that I think um, the more institutions can follow the lead of places like UConn, a place like WPI and others that, that truly are mission centric, that, that are trying to fulfill a specific mission, that are comfortable saying what they, they aren't um, in service of what they are and what they can be. 
And I agree. I think we need to do a better job at admissions of, of explaining that why, because I think it will help students in the sorting phase, but also in that phase, you know, when they don't get the good news, they, yeah. they may be able to understand it and understand why their why may align with another university's um, purpose better. So I, I want to be cognizant of time. Do you have a do you have a, a commitment in a minute? Uh, I have a all right. All right. Well, we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, so, uh, Vern, this has been this has been incredible. And seriously, I could I could go on and record another episode with you right now. But uh, I want to let you get to your three o'clock. Um, so I guess, you know, one one last piece of advice for students or parents about this process that you feel like we haven't touched on um, specific to, uh, you know, the application review. You know, what do you what do you want to leave folks with? Yeah, I mean, this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently because, you know, I have a 17 year old who's a junior in high school who is going through this exact process. And so one of the things that makes me feel good from a personal standpoint is that I'm telling her all the things that I talk to families about that I've been talking to families historically. So that makes <laughs> me feel good that I'm not just, you know, t saying out of talking out of both sides of my mouth. But, you know, the thing that I've been trying to impress upon her and I think well, actually, let me back up. The thing that I think is important for parents to understand is that we in the admissions office, um, you know, we are also parents and, and we're in the community and, and we are going through the same experiences as they, they are. Um, and, and so, you know, for instance, you know, with COVID and, and one of the questions we got asked a lot was that, well, you know, I'm not able to participate in this yeah. internship or I wasn't able to do this because of COVID. How's that going to affect my application? And and we understand that context. And and that's a part of our training that we we want readers to bring to the application review. So so I think that's something important that 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 folks need to understand is that we have that context because again, we're going through a lot of the same challenges, hardships that that our families, um, the, the students who are applying to our universities. But, you know, as I'm as I'm navigating, we're navigating the college search with our own daughter, you know, we want her to drive the car. So ultimately, you know, she is going to be the one who is going to have to wake up at 8 a.m. to go to a course on a minus 10 degree day and it's not going to be me it's not going to be us going to that so she needs to she she's the one who's going to be doing that so therefore she needs to go to a place that she's going to be able to be happy and feels comfortable even during those those, those tough times so we want her to drive the car but as a parent you know we have we have a role in this as well and so there are parameters that we have to put up and it's, a, it's appropriate for parents to have these conversations. So one of the conversations we've had with our daughter was that, you know, we, un, we know and we believe in the investment in the college education. And we're going to we're, we're, we're committed to that. However, we're not going to mortgage our retirement for your college education because we know that there are tremendous, high quality, more affordable institutions out there that you are able to enroll at. So, so again, we want you to ultimately find a school that's the right fit, but we also want you to understand that there are those guardrails that we are putting up. And, and we've had those conversations with her. And, and, and I think parents should feel comfortable in having those conversations. Um, but ultimately, you know, helping her based on what she is looking for you know, I'm able to, you know, partake some, you know, some, some advice on some of these schools you may want to be adding to your list and starting to research, not saying what you have to do this particular one, but, you know, giving her some suggestions on schools that she may want to go ahead and research and consider. And ultimately the hope is that she's going to select a university, be admitted to a university that that she's going to be able to be comfortable and be successful and and i have all the confidence in the world she's doing the research she's doing her due diligence 
just like any student out there, they, they're going to be able to find a school. Well, that's uh, that's uh, an excellent uh, point to end on, Vern. And man, you sound like you have it all together here. So I, in like seven or eight years, when I start this process, I'm calling you. You, you are cool as a cucumber, Vern. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. We'll have this conversation next year when she's a senior. Let's make sure everything that I've said is is true. I think it is, but but, but yeah, I'll talk you down. All right. Well, well. Good luck to you and your family, Vern. And thank you so much. This has been uh, this has been a pleasure. And thanks for uh, being being part of the inspiration to uh, to start this podcast. My pleasure. My pleasure. Always, always great to chat with you, Andy. Enjoying the podcast? Like and subscribe to this YouTube video. You can also find us on the web at InsideAdmissionPodcast.com. And you can find and engage with us on social media, where our handle is InsideAdmission, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook.